A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, in a time of favor I answer you, on the day of salvation I help you, and I have kept you and given you as a covenant to the people to restore the land and allot the desolate heritages, saying to the prisoners, come out, to those in darkness, show yourselves. Along the ways they shall find pasture. On every bare height shall their pastures be. Shall not hunger or thirst, nor shall the scorching wind or the sun strike them. For he who pities them leads them and guides them beside springs of water. I will cut a road through all my mountains and make my highways level. See. Some shall come from afar, others from the north and the west, and some from the land of Cyrene. Sing out, O heavens, and rejoice, O earth. Break forth into song, you mountains, for the Lord comforts his people and shows mercy to his afflicted. But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. Can a mother forget her infant? Be without tenderness for the child of her womb. Even should she forget, I will never forget you. The word of the Lord. The Lord is gracious and merciful. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. The Lord is good to all and compassionate toward all his works. The Lord, the, Lord is and the Lord is faithful in all his words and holy in all his works. The Lord lifts up all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The Lord, the Lord, is, and the Lord is just in all his ways and holy in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call upon him to all who call upon him in truth. Dominus Fobiscum, Lectio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Ioannem, Jesus answered the Jews, My Father is at work until now, so I am at work. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but he also called God his own father, making himself equal to God. Jesus answered and said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, the son cannot do anything on his own, but only what he sees the father doing. For what he does, the Son will also do. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these, so that you may be amazed. 
For just as the Father raises the dead and gives life, so also does the Son give life to whomever he wishes. Nor does the Father judge anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in the one who sent me has eternal life and will not come to condemnation, but has passed from death to life. Amen, amen, I say to you, the hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, so also he gave to the Son the possession of life in himself. And he gave him the power to exercise judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, because the hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come out, and those who have done good deeds to the resurrection of life, but those who have done wicked deeds to the resurrection of condemnation. I cannot do anything on my own. I judge as I hear, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Verbum Domini. It's worth noting that this section of Isaiah, chapter 49, is part of a section of Isaiah that was written right around the year 540 BC. Well, give or take a little bit. This is a time when the people are in exile in Babylon. They had been taken there in 598 as a the elite in Judah were taken as hostages, basically. And then, again, uh, the rest of the folks were sent into exile in Babylon in 587, 11 years later. And that's when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians. <coughs> They'd been in exile for 50 years or so, for some of them. And there'd be some who still remembered, but they were still alive, what it was like in Israel. And now the king of the Persians is about to destroy the Babylonian Empire. He was sweeping all across the Middle East. He had gone all the way up to what's now Turkey, got over to the Western Turkey, and then came back down and and sure enough, the next year or so, 539, he conquered Babylon. In fact, they opened the gates and let him in because they were so upset with their own king. Uh, so he would be the one to set them free. But they didn't see it yet. And when you think about this very large, successful army led by an extremely popular general, so popular that when he conquered other people, the other armies followed him too. He was able to convince his enemies to follow him because he was the kind of leader that people say, yeah, I'll go with him. And so you don't know, though, if you're imprisoned in a doomed city. Are you going to die? Will you be among those who get slaughtered? That at this point, they wouldn't know. And throughout this chapter, 
The Lord is speaking to his servant. There are four of these hymns of the servant of the Lord. This is the second one. And it tells him in the first seven verses of this chapter that he is going to be the one that brings God's word to the people. But here we see something different. He's addressing the servant and says, in a time of favor, I answer you on the day of salvation. I help you. I've kept you and given you as a covenant to the people. We read this passage during Great Lent because we apply these songs of the servant to Jesus Christ. He is the servant of the Lord. There are many others who serve the Lord, the prophets themselves, to be sure, and just rulers and just teachers. They serve the Lord too, but this is something that points towards Christ, and this is how we have understood this over the centuries. And think about this line where he says, I've kept you and given you as a covenant to the people. Normally, a covenant is an agreement that people make, right? That's what the Ten Commandments are. And, you know, it's part of a, the covenant. And it establishes a relationship. But here, the servant is going to be the covenant. There is one very important place where this comes into life, and that's at the Last Supper. At the Last Supper, Jesus, the servant of the Lord, who will fulfill the next ones as well. He will, the, the next servant song, uh, we'll read, as a matter of fact, we'll read the first verses of this on Tuesday of Holy Week. That's why we skipped them today. And then we'll read the, the, the third servant song on Wednesday of Holy. That's chapter 51, where it talks about him getting slapped and spat upon. And then the last one we read on Good Friday, because it talks about the suffering servant who dies and suffers for the sake of our sins and for our healing. But this is very crucial he says, I've made you as a covenant to the people. It's at the Last Supper that this crucial prophecy comes to bear. When the Lord takes the chalice and says, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. One of the reasons this is so essential to understand is that the prophets Ezekiel and Jeremiah had told the people in exile. Well, first, Jeremiah was speaking in the 590s in Jerusalem and told the people of Jerusalem, you broke the covenant, it's done. Ezekiel was one of the people that went into the first exile in 598, and he was telling the people already in Babylon, the covenant has been broken, it's done. But then both of them proclaimed that there would be a new covenant. That's where this whole sense at the end of this passage but Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me, my Lord has forgotten me. And the Lord said, I will never forget you. Forgetting is metaphysically impossible for God to do. God cannot forget. We do. We have limited minds. He is truly eternal and never can forget because nothing is past to him. Everything is always present. And so even what we call past, it remains present to God. That's his nature. So he can't forget. But 
he w certainly won't forget Israel. He loves them. And he even says, can a mother forget her infant? Well, even if she could, I can't. And I won't. And so the people in living in this exile knew that the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel had said the covenant was over. And they felt perhaps abandoned. And we have to pay attention to that because a lot of times people feel abandoned by God at different times. And oftentimes that's it, what seems to be abandoned by God forgotten by God in some way, is a, a feeling that I don't see how he's helping me in difficult situations. Life is hard, and we get into difficult situations, and it seems that way. But notice here in this passage how he calls to mind their exodus from Egypt. You know, he's saying to... He's telling the folks in there, uh, to prisoners, come out. Those in darkness, that is in dark cells, you can come out. These are the most vulnerable people. They can't do anything for themselves if they're in prison. But they shall come out and they shall go through the desert and they won't get scorched, just like happened in the Exodus. And that he will give springs of water to come out just like in the Exodus. And uh, you, I will bring you from the ends of the earth. Sayin, that he mentions here, is modern-day Aswan in uh, southern Egypt by the first cataract of the Nile. So all of this, he will bring them back and make it like the Exodus. And the reason I want to bring that up with this text, as, as the prophet does, the people of Israel were in Egypt for 400 years, they never heard from God. No prophet arose. It would seem as if they were abandoned. They hadn't heard anything. And it's hard to think about, but you know, why would that be? And the line that the Lord says about Egypt, that that is the furnace, that place of slavery. It's the furnace. Why be in a furnace? There's a purification that goes on. And in one sense, when you look back, it's hard to see it when you're in the middle of problems. Really hard to see. But when you look back, you can see the people of Israel who had been in Egypt for those 400 years were actually kept safe had they remained in the promised land in what was filled with Canaanites, they would have been involved in the petty wars that constantly went all over that country as one tribe fought against another. There were constant wars. And by being in Egypt were things, maybe they ended up as slaves but they ended up actually being protected from annihilation. Egypt was a stable society. There's nothing else about Egypt. They were stable. And they kept things pretty much uh, in good order. That's what they cared about most, having good order. And they worshiped the God of order. They, that was key for them. And in that 400 years, the people were able to grow and develop into a people. And then the Lord sent Moses and brought them out. You could only see that in retrospect. You couldn't see it when you're in the midst of it. That's for sure. But this is a good model for us to understand, just as the people living in exile, where it was a safe, quiet place. You know, they, some of them even prospered when they were in Babylon. And the, until this salvation comes, and it's the, the act of salvation by Cyrus that is a threat, and they feel this threat. But in the midst 
all that long waiting, God will come and give direction. And in retrospect, you can look back and see, oh, this kind of worked out. This worked out to have a salvation and a next stage of my own history, the people's history, that I couldn't see. I don't think that is different for the lives of most of us as individuals. There are a lot of things that people go through. They cannot see in the midst of the problems they're in what the Lord is doing and this long-term plan. We just don't. And sometimes we feel abandoned. This reminds us that the Lord has this long-term plan, part of which was just as in Egypt to purify the people of Israel and keep them safe. Here in Babylon, there was a purification. They finally got over their desire for the other gods. Remember how often in the Old Testament the prophets kept criticizing them for worshiping other gods? They really got over it. This purified them of that. But it's hard to see in the midst of the purification where it's all going. Only later could they understand. And for all of us to examine our lives and to keep in mind this opening line that the Lord has made Jesus a covenant with us. He is the covenant in his blood that we come here to receive at this altar. And that because he is the God, he personifies that covenant. And we can receive him. This is often what we have to remind ourselves, that that ultimate servant of the Lord is there to be with us when we seem abandoned, and he can be with us because even on the cross, he will cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The one who is this covenant is there with us at moments of difficulty, abandonment, and suffering. And we can also trust that just as the Lord will never forget us because of this covenant that we have with him, so also will we one day be raised up and that all that we looked at as a horrible abandonment and problem will be something that he brings to a good we could not have foreseen. But then we look back and say, oh, that's what you were doing.